Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Comic-Con at Home. I'm so happy you could join us for this virtual panel with a cast and producers of The Capture, which is streaming exclusively on Peacock. My name is Filiana Ng, Senior Editor of TV at Entertainment Tonight, and we're going to be digging into this excellent British drama um, that explores the kind of increasingly blurred lines between what's real and what's not. Um, and the show asks the question in this kind of post-truth era, can we really believe what we see? But before we dig into this series, uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists who are spread out across um, two continents. Um, first, from the UK, we have series creator, writer, and director Ben Channon. Hello. Executive producer Rosie Allison. Hello. Holiday Granger, who plays uh, Detective Inspector Rachel Carey. Hi, guys. Bye. Callum Turner, who plays Sean Emery. Hello. Uh, and from the U.S., we have Ron Perlman, who plays Frank Napier. Hi. And Famke Jansen, who plays Jessica Mallory, someone we meet later in the series. Hi, everyone. Awesome. Hi, guys. Thanks, thanks for Hi. hopping on and, and doing this. Uh, ha has, this been, has it been a while since you've all kind of seen each other in, in kind of one room or when yeah. you know how we've all been in lockdown <laughs> <laughs> many many months i've seen it, I think it was about a year ago a rap party <laughs> yeah. yeah i left the one in gelson's actually <laughs> yeah but since then yeah i've just seen a lot of callum over the computer awesome before we get into the q a we're going to play the trailer just so everyone at home can kind of get a better idea of what the show is ben do you want to kind of tee up what the show is about the show came about through um my work in documentaries um as i realized i worked with the police quite a lot in documentaries and i realized that um increasingly uh people are getting uh, convicted through video evidence more and more reliably and at the same time you can now get apps on your phone that take uh, you know do digital face transplants that are cheap effective and convincing I thought to myself, you know, what if those two technological and, um, and criminological developments were to collide? So that was the kind of inspiration for it. Cool. Uh, yeah, let's play the trailer. In the last few hours, dramatic footage has emerged online, depicting a man believed to be former soldier Sean Emery attacking and abducting a woman. That's him. A woman's missing. Oh, and Sean Emery is our suspect. Is anyone going to tell me what the problem is? You're under suspicion for assault and kidnapping. You do know that your suspect's a national hero. Two tours in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, and how do we repay his service? You mind telling me where she is? What happened between you and Hannah Roberts? She kissed me. She got on a bus. That's the last I see of her. This ain't what happened. This ain't what happened. None of this happened. This ain't real. What have you done? This ain't real. What have you done? What do you mean he's gone? He's escaped from an emergency exit. Run facial wreck. Make him a target. Now, Sean claims this has somehow been fabricated. Almost anything is possible these days. If properly done, it's impossible to prove. What are we tiptoeing around for? I think someone's tampering with evidence. We don't know whose turf we're treading on. I understand you have this drive, but counterintelligence, you can rarely see the whole picture. I know it when they say move along, nothing to see. They're lying. The police think I've done it, my ex thinks I've done it, and between me and you, there are moments when I'm scared that I've done it. You knew what was at stake. You would walk away and pretend this never happened. The intelligence community has hurt a lot of people. We need to find the soldier. Find out which school his daughter goes to. If you could see what we are working on, I'm talking about images that will haunt you for the rest of your life. While you're watching everybody else, don't ever assume there isn't somebody watching you. Nice trailer. 
Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm getting anxious just kind of like after that trailer. How are you guys feeling? It's so good to see it again. It's been so long. It's, it made me feel really excited. <laughs> it's pretty dynamic. It's one of the, um, I mean, it's very rare to have a, a writer, director do the whole thing. So Ben has both written all six episodes, directed them all, and he just, he's a master storyteller. And he came up with this, extraordinary sort of unmissable thriller where you really it makes you think it's got the the big picture um the big picture paranoia about the uncertainty of digital manipulation but he also was very sure to make you feel as well and so he's got these two fantastic lead characters uh sean the soldier who's caught on cctv um apparently committing a crime which he denies and then holiday the detective who begins to investigate and unravel the truth of what really happened and is our sort of um, eyes on the moral maze of the story. But, uh, but it's all credit to Ben, so I should stop talking, but uh, it's really rare to find this master storyteller who can do all these things and uh, you know, bring them together. No, keep uh. talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, I certainly didn't realize um, how contemporary it was going to be. Um, I started writing this before the term deep fake, I, before I'd heard of it, before it became a, a common phrase. Even fake news wasn't really a, a household phrase when I started writing. And then as I was writing, the sort of, the news started to catch up with the story. And I started to factor, factor in the language of the day into the, into the dialogue, otherwise it would have felt weird, people not referencing those things. But clearly, we're living through a time when every piece of footage, every piece of news is being questioned, and rightly so. Uh, but then the flip side of that is that that's being exploited by people as well. Um, to the point where you know, it's, it suits uh, certain politicians to, um, if we don't quite know what's real. Yeah, I mean, you kind of mentioned the two kind of amazing lead characters. Holiday, you play Rachel, who is this ambitious, kind of eager, um, very detective who's kind of thrown into the mix in this high profile Sean Emery case, right? Uh, what stood out to you about Rachel that, that kind of immediately drew you in? Um, I kind of loved that when I first started reading the scripts, I didn't know if I liked her or not. Um, and that it was, it was a sort of, because she doesn't really care. It's like she's there to do a job and she's ambitious and she wants to do well and prove herself. And um, you know, she's, she kind of, um, she's not necessarily a people pleaser. Um, and I just love Ben's, um, the way that Ben weaves such a moral conundrum for Carrie throughout the whole series that she's, um, you know, when we first meet her, she has such faith in the authorities and in the institution of the police. And, but she also has like an incredibly strong moral compass and a need to fight for, and get to the bottom of the truth. And when those two aspects of her sort of, of her faiths like collide, um, it's a, this is kind of complete, yeah, moral maze that she goes through. Awesome. And, and Callum, I mean, first of all, congratulations on, on your BAFTA TV nomination. Thank you very much. <laughs> was that a pleasant surprise? Yeah, it was a lovely surprise. Yeah. Yeah. What intrigued me about Sean was kind of there's a point in the series when even he starts to question his own understanding of the truth. Um, as an actor, how did you kind of approach playing that internal struggle? Like he's constantly on uh, edge. Well, I was, I always saw Sean as like a, a freedom fighter of his own mind in, in, in some sense, because you meet this man as he's in the limelight, he's famous for something that no one wants to really be famous for, for killing someone. And he's questioning how he got there, how, how he got to that place. And he's, really trying to change how the world views him, how his family view him, how, how, his, how his friends view him, how he views himself. And he's, he's about to do that. Um, he gets off with the case in the first episode and then he's dragged back into this nightmare. And um, on a higher level, it could be like a long day's journey into the night kind of man searching for his soul journey that he goes on. And I, I just wanted to do that. And then on top of that, there was working with Ben and Holiday and, and, and Rosie and those guys and the BBC and, uh, and, and the character that was really intelligent. I think both the characters that Holiday and I have are working it out as we're going along. 
and alongside the audience. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's so gripping because no one's ahead of anyone at any stage. Yeah, definitely. Um, Ron, I mean, you've made a career out of, of playing badasses, I feel like, like Hellboy and um, Clay and, and Sons of Anarchy. Um, Frank kind of falls under that umbrella too, but there's a limit to his power. Um, what was appealing to you about Frank and, and the lengths that he kind of goes to complete his mission? Very similar to what Holiday said, you know, um, I, first thing you want to do is figure out where you fit into the story. And the thing that was so smart about the way Ben rendered Frank was that um, all the way to the end, you don't know whether you're dealing with the good guy or the bad guy. You don't know whether you're supposed to feel sympathy for the, for this guy's plight um, or how he views his place in the world and his job. Um, or whether he's a monster um, and will do anything in order to um, justify his agenda. Um, his agenda seems rather to be the tail that's wagging the dog. Um, and so the whole kind of thing is a, is a mind, I can't use the word, right? Um, anyway, if I, if I could use the word mind, I would use it, but I can't. So, um, but uh, the notion of of there not being any relief for the audience to figure out, wait a minute, um, I'm I'm having so much trouble keeping track of who's the good guy here, who's the bad guy here, and you know Frank uh, is the head of the class when it comes to to that head fake. Definitely. Um, Famka, you're, you're no stranger to playing Fierce Women and, and Jessica Mallory, although she doesn't come in until like late into the season, Jessica Mallory is, is someone who kind of lords over Frank a little bit, right? Uh, and, and your introduction kind of, you make quite a splash when you come in. Uh, what do you want people to know about Jessica and what did you like about this character? Foremost, um, I was very excited to be part of the project because I thought Ben did such an incredible job with the screenplays and um, uh, I've been spending my time between London and New York for the last couple of years and I was just struck when I was in London but how many CCTV cameras there are I've never seen anything quite like it so um, and I'm very I want to get very much involved in the whole big brother sort of conspiracy theory and whatever so when I read this piece I was like this is so of the moment this is so timely this whole notion of fake news of not knowing what's real of constantly having to fact check and double check everything. And this is an absolutely frightening notion of what could happen in the world, in where we, you know, in the world that we live in today. And so I thought it was the story that had to be told and it was done so well by Ben and then his, the cast that he put together is, you know, Rosie obviously is an amazing producer. So it was just a, uh, there was it was a no brainer in terms of signing up to do it and um, uh, we uh, Ron and I had just worked on Asher the year prior a movie uh, that Ron also produced and so it was really nice to come in and have a different dynamic between us as characters than we had before and sort of coming in as this looming you know dark figure from the CIA and we're not entirely sure what her motives are and how deep this um, potential conspiracy or whatever it is runs. So those were some of the reasons why I ended up saying yes to this. Plus I got to be in London, which is one of my favorite places in the world. So. Yeah, pretty awesome deal. Um, for the cast, I mean, how, were you familiar with this world before? Uh, what kind of prep work did you do to become familiar with this world if you weren't before um, and, and to play your, your characters? Um, yeah, I, mean, I felt like I was familiar with the uh, detective world just from watching detective shows. <laughs> you know, I, was like, <laughs> I love the killing, I love the bridge, um, I've, and uh, I've always been a fan of them. But, you know, I didn't really know much about the actual police force. Um, but Ben's script, you know, was so well researched that reading them, I felt like I, you know, I could see the differences between my expectations and what was on the page. Um, but I managed to get a... Um, I must worm my way in with the Met and do a week's shadowing um, in the homicide department. Um, 
and also shadowed a couple of other women that were sort of at, her, at Carrie's level that had a similar background to her um, that had transferred freshly to homicide. And that was just to see what actually happens and to pick people's brains as well, to just, you know, try and find holes in Ben's script and there weren't any. It was like, you know, to like to say, does this really happen? Would this happen? Like, um, and just the terminology used and everything was, um, was amazing. And also Ben set up um, a few meetings with uh, his counter-terror advisor, which was completely like eye-opening and mind-blowing as to, you know, what is probably happening, what's possibly happening, what definitely is happening. Um, yeah, that was interesting. You ended up on an actual murder investigation, huh? No, I did. Wow. I, mean, I like, well, I kind of, there were like three. <laughs> what I was surprised with is how many invest, like, like a homicide a detective family um, investigations they cover at the same time. And one of them was a cold case that was in my area. And I ended up on a, she'd not been to the crime scene before. So I ended up on a walk around of the crime scene in my local area. And because I knew the park better than them, I was just like, oh no, 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 this is the quickest entrance. So this, this is the nearest entrance to the pond and these are the woods. And felt like I was like, you know, I was determined I was gonna solve that. I was, they were still looking for the body like a few years later. And I still think when I walk through that park, I might come across it. Wow, that's amazing. I mean. Callum, what kind of shocked or surprised you in, in kind of researching like surveillance culture and, and, and doing research to, to um, get into this world? The, the, the thing that actually shocked me the most was how much fun soldiers have when they're on tour and how much uh, enjoyment there is and uh, how it becomes quickly their normality. Um, there's, I guess, being so close to death all the time, you have to live every moment as it comes with, as if it is your last moment, you know, your friends are dying, not everyone's dying all the time, but people die around you and, and you are close to that. Um, and that was the thing that, that, that surprised me the most. And then also I did some weapons training, uh, which was interesting and some surveillance stuff too. You aced the weapons training? Why was it interesting? <laughs> Why was it interesting? Because they're so powerful and loud mm. and they're shooting, a, shooting a sniper is, it's, it's, it's a, quite an intense experience. And, and I hadn't shot, um, I'd shot handguns before, but I hadn't shot a massive, it hurts, you know. Your surveillance training sounded intense as well. Yeah, my surveillance training was. <laughs> I think yeah. I'm a bit jealous of you for that. I think I, I, think I want to go into like, try and, try and dodge. You should do it for the next. Time. Yeah, maybe I should. You should hook that up. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I ended up following people around London, trying to avoid getting caught and then um, and then, uh, and then trying not to get caught going around. It was a lot of fun. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I mean, for for Ron and maybe Bamka, to me as a viewer, just watching this show, like I found myself kind of trying to crack the code on on who was actually good, who was evil, who was telling the truth, whose story I actually believe. Did you find yourself kind of doing that as you were reading the scripts and as you were kind of filming? That's one of the reasons why I signed on because it is really, a, it was a page turner and it's in the same when you watch it, it's constantly, you're, you're constantly questioning everything and everybody. Um, you know, what is the truth? And that is something that we're just dealing with on a daily basis today. It is so absolutely of the moment. It's so timely, this show. So, I, you know, that is, Incredible. I wish I had been able to do any kind of on the ground CIA uh, type of, but I have no connections there because that would have seemed fascinating to be, you know, with people like that um, next time, one day, hopefully. Yeah, I, I, I feel horrible that I don't have great stories <laughs> to um, share with you about my research and stuff that Callum and Holiday were talking about, about ride-alongs and shadowing. Uh, I wish I had. I realized that I was joining a world um, that uh, I didn't know a great deal about in terms of, you know, the internal um, ministrations of how things, uh, uh, responsibilities are handed down and, and what one does in the name of pulling one's weight. And, and uh, so, for me, um, it was deferring completely to uh, to Ben. This was his world. He had a very a strong notion about 
um, not only the world that I was occupying, but uh, but also how he interacted with all of the other uh, areas of law enforcement. You know, all of the areas of law enforcement are are represented in the show. You have local, you have state, you have uh, federal, and you have international. And you know where Frank comes in is like. You know, he's a stranger in a strange land. He's an American operative in the UK. So immediately, everybody looks at him side-eyed and suspect. And as if he has some sort of a strange representation of uh, some diabolical thing that exists on the other side of the pond. So right off the bat, he's being regarded askew. And then you meet him and you realize that's very justified. Um, that, you know, um, people should be uh, uh, suspect of uh, what America's interests are and, and um, what, 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 particularly what this guy's um, modus operandi uh, includes um, in the name of keeping people safe. Um, where does that concept end and some sort of personal agenda about um, human rights begin. And so that's the exercise of Frank. And for me, it was a, um, an exercise in deferring to the filmmaker, the guy who wrote the thing and the guy who was going to actually, you know, get these performances out of us in order to um, um, realize his vision. And that was, that was everything to me. For, for the actors, I mean, how has your role in, in this show um, kind of changed your view on, on surveillance? And has it made you more aware of, of cameras and, and made you kind of more protective of your own kind of personal privacy? I definitely um, started noticing cameras more than I did before. And I'm there incredibly private as a person. Um, I don't do social media or anything that, you know, just to protect my privacy. Everything is turned off on my phone in terms of location services and all of that kind of stuff. But just knowing the ends to which people can go and how incredibly complicated it is in today's world to have any type of privacy and what you do and say can be used against you. Um, and then with manipulation of existing um, footage makes it even more frightening. To me. It's almost like um, all of the all of the the, uh, the care you take in preserving your um, privacy. What this show did for me was say it doesn't really matter what you do; they're listening, and they're watching, and they can do anything that they want with that information, depending on what kind of mood they're in at any given time, which is or depending on who's sitting in the in the seat of power. Um, which comes into play in this story as well. Um, you know, we have politicians in high places and all around the world that are telling you you didn't see what you just saw. Uh, those are our leaders. So what, what kind of a shot do we have at maintaining, you know, some sort of a, a real perspective? I think the timing of Ben wanting to tell the story is just phenomenal. One of the um, one of the things that comes through so clearly from the show is that we all know the phrase "Big Brother is watching you," but what Ben's done is taken it to the next level and said, "Big Brother's not just watching you; he can do all these different things with your, you know, it's the digital manipulation element that is really scary and is the next step in personal paranoia." Yeah, I mean, that kind of leads into my next question kind of perfectly. Like, has your paranoia kind of grown as a result of of being part of this project? Well, 19, 1984 and Brave New World are two of my favorite books. Um, and I know Ben loves them too. And uh, what's so brilliant about the show is it stays true to the conspiracy thriller um, nature of it. You know, uh, the parallax views and... Uh, is it three nights on the condo? Three nights on the three days on the condo. Three days of the condo, yeah. Three days of the condo. That kind of those kind of movies, and it stays true to that, and 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 takes us on the journey. It's also, I think, F four is kind of like Rambo First Blood. I don't know what you think, Ben. I love, I love it that, that it didn't occur to me when I wrote it, but when you said it, I thought, yeah, okay, that's a good yeah. movie. It's another seventies movie, right? Is it seventies, yeah. or is it nineteen eighty? Might be eighties, yeah. 
come on, Rosie, you know. I don't know when it was. That's not my <laughs> scene. <though. laughs> Late seventies, possibly nineteen eighty. But it's that it's that sort of. I would add blow out, blow out, blow up, and blow out to the to the list of things films that inspire this. The conversation. Conversation. I was just the conversation. conversation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to have those movies as your inspiration, you yeah. know, mm. and put it into today's world. Mm. Yeah, and there is just that whole thing that we've all grown up thinking that there is such a thing as documentary evidence and it's a gold standard. And, and now we're in an age where we just have to accept that documentary evidence just ain't documentary evidence anymore necessarily. I'm going through this really weird period where I just find the, the, the notion of how much information we have access to and, and, and how much is just being poured on us on a daily basis because of the 24 hour news cycle and social media and things, ways of getting us uh, tidbits of situations that are so outlandishly unjust that you can't do a thing about. So, you know, at what point do you completely turn off? At what point do you become cynical? At what point do you give up? Um, at what point do you say, you know, I can't, Never for the grace of God go I, I can't fix all of the ills of the world. So I'm just going to stick to my little tiny little corner. You know, oh, what's that great line? You know, I'm going to just sit in my little, on my little couch and watch my little 60 inch TV and just leave me alone. Let me have my beer. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, for me, I didn't even know anything about the concept of CCTV until I read the script. Then I arrive in London, and um, every every time I looked up, somebody was looking back at me. <laughs> this is something that I hadn't even begun to, you know, fold into to my consciousness. Because you got, you guys don't have anything else right? to worry about. I mean, you know, now what do I do about that? You know, <laughs> as if I don't have enough to worry about. Well. Um... Yeah, I mean, because this is Comic-Con and, and many of you have kind of ties to big franchises like X-Men and Hellboy and Fantastic Beasts, I have to ask, like, what do you guys geek out over uh, personally? Like, what is your kind of big nerd obsession? I'll start with Holiday. Um, what do I geek out over? Um, I mean, I think we already said it at the beginning, like, so it was like detective shows. Um, so like The Killing, The Bridge, Luther, um, Prime Suspect. Um, yeah. I still geek out over Cary Grant. I'm sorry. Doesn't. Uh, that's my, um, you know, black, black and white 30s and 40s movies um, are my refuge. That's where I escape to um, the notion of a more ordered world, less self-indulgent world, a more sophisticated world where not everybody was crying in their beer. Um, people were just getting on with it. And the, the level of uh, discourse was erudite and sophisticated and dripping with charm. No matter what I do, that's where I keep going back to. That's my refuge. Mine's, mine's always comedies and it varies in its... Uh in my watching i'm watching a lot of modern family right now mm. i love that show and and ben and rosie what about you guys i i geek out over hellboy uh, x-men fantastic <laughs> beasts harry potter <laughs> I um, wow I think, uh, <laughs> Seinfeld is my is the thing that I just I've watched all my life. I continue to watch it. I watch it with my family throughout lockdown. It's kind of kept us sane. There's not much better than than eating a pizza and watching Seinfeld. It's a good show. In, in time of in time of sorrow, I turn to Gene Kelly. He's my go-to uh, uh, particular numbers that I watch over and over. But I did just uh, watch Normal People twice. I enjoyed that so much. The uh, oh, that show. Uh, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, lastly, before we wrap, I mean, one thing the cap truth gets at is that the truth is very complicated, right? And and in, extremely layered. Um, and and the show also kind of raises very important moral questions. Um, 
Ben, I'll, I'll throw it to you. What do you want people to take away from the series and, and what questions do you want people to ask that they didn't before? I suppose the central question is in a world where uh, every piece of video footage could be uh, manipulated, uh, how, how can we believe what we see? Awesome, very succinct. Uh, cool, well, I think that's all the time we have. I mean, thank you so much for joining the cast and producers of The Capture for this uh, virtual Comic-Con at Home panel. You can watch all six episodes of the first season exclusively on NBC Universal streaming service, Peacock, and the series will be back for a second season at some point. Um, yeah, thanks again to Ben, Rosie, Holiday, Callum, Ron, and Bamka for a great discussion. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to see you. Nice seeing everybody. Great to see everybody. Big yeah. hug. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Lots of love, guys. Uh, Lovely painting, Famka. Lovely painting. Oh, thank you. I just finished it, and I had to cover it there, so I had to improvise and cover the painting that was not that I didn't do. So I thought, oh, just let me just put that. So oh, this is your this is really painting lot. by you. How lovely. Yes, I, I paint, but I've been doing in lockdown for months. It's wonderful. It's such a great hobby to have. Beautiful. It's really beautiful. Nice, yeah. It is beautiful. Yeah, great. All right. Nice seeing everybody. Have nice. Great. Cool. Bye. Bye. Bye.